Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Therapist Uncensored. This is a podcast that breaks down interpersonal science into practical and understandable tidbits. And as you listen, I can just imagine little light bulbs of insight appearing above your head. You're going to be surprised and touched at what you learn about yourself as you get more accurate and in-depth view of your mind and your heart and as you figure out those close to you. Therapist Uncensored brings you decades of experience with interpersonal psychotherapy, relational neuroscience, modern attachment, and anything else they think will be helpful in healing humans. Now, here are your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Hey, everybody. Welcome to 2020. We are, this is our first show of the year. We're very excited about it. We had a really tough year last year. So we're really happy to turn the page and couldn't be more excited about starting this year with this interview. So let me introduce you to Bruce Ecker and Tori Olds, because I think that listeners here, it's like heads up, you're going to really want to hear this because Bruce Ecker is co-founder of Coherence Therapy and co-author of Unlocking the Emotional Brain, Eliminating Symptoms at Their Roots Using Memory Reconsolidation. So basically his interest has been in using the innovations in neuroscience and the breakthrough in brain research and being able to transform that into making therapy more effective, which who wouldn't love that, right? His thesis basically is that transformational change has to do with memory reconsolidation. And so you'll learn more about that as you listen to the episode. But we're really honored to have him on board. And Tori Olds is a friend and colleague. She's also a licensed psychotherapist. She practices in Austin, Texas. And she's a training director and part owner of Deep Eddy Psychotherapy, which is a training and counseling center, which houses 30 clinicians. I was so surprised to hear that. 30 clinicians. Way to go, guys. Her interest is similar to many that listen to this podcast because she likes to integrate lots of different theories and find the best of the best and what really works. And she integrates, in particular, experiential approaches to therapy. She does a lot of training in person and online and... I know that you'll be interested in hearing more about her. As a matter of fact, it is through her and her organization, Deep Betty Psychotherapy, that they are bringing Bruce Eckert to Austin, Texas for a live professional conference coming up very shortly. It's on February 15th and 16th. One day is the introduction to the idea, and the next day is a deep intensive about really how to make this come alive. It's for professionals and... Let's see, you would sign up for that or find out more about it at deepeddypsychotherapy.com. It's called Coherence Therapy, Unlocking the Emotional Brain Through Memory Reconsolidation. Okay, without further ado, let's jump right in. So welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have two incredibly, incredibly talented clinicians. One of them is a very dear friend of mine, Tori Olds, and she has helped connect us with someone who I've wanted to have on the show for quite some time, actually. And that is Bruce Ecker. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Tori, can you tell the audience why that you were so excited to uh, make that connection for us? Yes. And thank you, Sue, for doing this. I was excited to have Bruce on the show and we'll be having him come to Austin for a training. You know, for me as a person that's worked in the experiential domain for a few years now, you know, studying ADP and IFS and somatic experiencing, Bonnie Badenoch's work, and I've been training for about six years. I've been leading a training group just starting today to get that going for the semester. Again, I'll be leading four training groups a week on how to integrate experiential psychotherapies. So I guess it was about two years ago, my friend Julianne Taylor Shore, who's actually been on this podcast before. Yes, she I believe. She's fantastic. People loved her. <laughs> she, she knows so much about the brain. She stays so cutting edge. So when she told me, hey, you need to check out this guy's work, I really jumped on it. But what was really exciting for me as someone who loves learning, and in fact, this is probably great for anyone listening to this podcast, because I imagine people listening, especially the therapists listening, are those that like to integrate a bunch of different theories and want to know everything and aren't just in their one, like just CBT or just EMDR, or, you know. You're totally right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we we wanting, change lines a lot. <laughs> yeah. Changing and just like exciting and, and wanting to know all and all, how it all fits together. 
And that's so rich and exciting. But as a teacher, I can find sometimes it can be a little bit much to figure out, okay, but then how does this all come together? When I'm really sitting with someone, how do I pull it together so it doesn't feel disjointed? Like I'm jumping to this theory now and now I'm, oh shoot, maybe I should be over in this theory. And so for me, my eyes went like bugged out of my head, you know, when I first read Bruce's work, because it was like, oh my gosh, here is an incredibly clear articulation of an overarching theory of change. So let me just say that coherence therapy is more than just a therapy, you know, like most therapies. It, it, yes, it does have its techniques and delineated ideas of how you can approach the work that I think are really honed and beautiful. But more importantly, it's an overarching model of the change process. And what Bruce and Laurel Hully, you know, have delineated is a series of experiences, not so much techniques, but experiences that the brain needs to move through in order to make that transformation. Actually, in order to unlock at the synaptic level, implicit learning so that they can be updated. And I know Bruce will talk about that more eloquently than me, so I'll leave it at that. But because that's looking at underneath what's actually happening, what the brain actually needs to experience for change versus what techniques need to happen, it's a beautiful way to understand how experiential therapies, not all therapies, hopefully later we'll talk about the difference between counteractive and non-counteractive approaches, but the more experiential therapies where you're trying to understand what's underneath and shift what's underneath versus just control it from above. All of those theories, for me, in integrating them, it really helped to have a conceptualization that I could say, okay, or I'm I'm learning a new theory, let's say. It's like, oh, I can see how this fits now. And so in my training and in my own clinical work, it's just been incredibly helpful. So I'm I'm really grateful, Bruce, to you for (laughs) being so, you know, putting together this book. Unlocking the Emotional Brain is the book that kind of got me into it. And it's so clearly delineated. So that's I guess very that's the first. Exciting. I just wanted yeah. to say that all. Oh, the yeah, point. that's They're really gonna, great. Like, train and- oh, believe me, everybody now is like, yeah. tell us all about <laughs> I know, it. exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, how is that to hear from Tori, by the way? <laughs> it's music to my ears. <laughs> it's very, I'd like to just sit here and keep listening I to I know, Tori. I was thinking she's great. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell thank the audience you, like, just you. a really uh, brief uh, synopsis of kind of where where you're coming at this from, and then let's jump right in. Okay. The way Tori put it is very apt. Remarkably, neuroscience researchers discovered this phenomenon that they named memory reconsolidation, and it'll become clear, I think, why that's the name. In the late 1990s, and by now there's a lot of research on it, you know, we understand a lot about how it works. Of course, there's more they'll find out. You know, they're digging into the molecular levels, and it's very complex. But on the experiential level that Tori was emphasizing, it's not that complex to understand how this works. Conceptually, to have a, a mental map of it, and I think that'll be useful to chalk out. But the essence is what Tori said. The brain requires a well-defined set of experiences in order to literally unlock, in other words, neurochemically unlock the encoding of even a lifelong powerful emotional learning. And I think we'll probably get into defining and illustrating what that phrase means, really. Uh, We're all familiar with it, but it'll be good to get on the same page about specifically what it means. And unlock the neural encoding of well-established emotional learnings. I suppose the most simple idea we have is Pavlovian conditioning, where a harmless light has become associated with, a, say, a mild foot shock. And so when the light goes on, now there's fear. Well, that's an emotional learning, and it's not in the conceptual part of the brain. It's in the subcortical brain. It's whole body response with expecting that shock when the light comes on and therefore feeling fear very suddenly. Well, that's how emotional learnings work. And most of them in human life operate from outside of awareness. We learn so many things without awareness of learning them and without awareness that those learnings are now controlling both our behavior in certain ways and our state of mind in certain ways. No, it's it's like a a trick that nature has played on us, isn't it? (laughs) Very much so, very much so. In fact, in some of my writings, I really emphasize that we are prisoners of these emotional learnings. And not only that, but they don't fade out over time and they aren't 
supposed to. You know, the brain evolved over hundreds of millions of years so that emotional learnings stay rapidly responsive for a lifetime unless this very special process of memory reconsolidation takes place. And as I mentioned, it was discovered in the late 1990s. And for almost 100 years before that, neuroscientists didn't catch it out. They were studying intensively for most of that last century something called extinction right? Uh, Most people have a sense of what extinction is. You learn something, and then you have many experiences uh, in a laboratory of it not happening, and the response, you know, diminishes. But what's fascinating is that extinction never erased the target learning or the target response. You can bring it right back. (laughs) You can bring it right back. It gets diminished immediately, and then it comes back, which shows that it's not erased or unlearned. Mm -hmm. So until the late 90s, neuroscientists and memory researchers believed that the brain didn't have a mechanism for erasure. And then, boom, all of a sudden, there it is. It was discovered by a few labs, and now it's one of the major fields of memory research by neuroscientists. And indeed, the brain requires a certain set of experiences that unlock the neural encoding of the target learning and update it with new learning. That's a useful functional definition of memory reconsolidation, that it is the brain's built-in natural way to use new learning to directly update and re-encode an existing old learning. So what we've been doing is applying in therapy sessions, or in other words, creating, designing the methodology of therapy in order to focus on creating the same set of experiences that have been shown to erase emotional learnings in laboratory studies by neuroscientists. And we see when we succeed in doing that, and of course in therapy it gets very complicated in many cases. It's not just a simple Pavlovian association. You have human beings form pretty complicated emotional learnings in some cases. And yet what we find consistently is that when we succeed in facilitating the same set of experiences that neuroscientists have shown to erase emotional learnings, we then see the very same markers or or results that are distinctive, unambiguous markers of erasure. In other words, there's no other brain process known to current science or neuroscience that can produce These markers of profound unlearning, profound change, where a longstanding symptom, such as depression or panic attacks or compulsive behavior, completely stops, completely disappears. In addition, the underlying emotional activation or state of mind or what therapists sometimes call ego state also ceases to ever happen again. The altered state of reactivity that was producing that symptom or problem also stops happening. And those two big changes then are seen to persist permanently and effortlessly. There's no effort required to maintain them once you get that to happen. So it sounds Uh, too good to be true. It does. (laughs) It sounds like this elixir. of. (laughs) It, It does. And yet we've seen it happen before our very eyes. I see Tori nodding like crazy as I'm, saying these things. So yes, we've been working on learning how to teach this methodology to therapists and happily have found that, yes, it's teachable. They go off and do it and they let us know, wow, this really does work. And it's not a miracle cure. It's not a cookie cutter thing you go in and mechanically, you know, march through. It takes a lot of skill on the part of therapists. And it takes being uh, at home with emotional process, you know, well, maybe we should get into... Uh, That's what I was going to say is, what does it look you know, like? I wonder if Tori even could Yeah, say I, I, I had muted Tori. myself, so I wouldn't be getting in the way, you know, wouldn't be getting noise. Yeah. But I was, yeah, I was nodding as he was saying that from my own experience doing the work. But I will say, seeing Bruce's work, which I've seen a number of cases, you yeah. can actually get online and pay for it and, and watch a number of cases and then in person a number of cases experiencing it on myself as the client. Say more about that. Say more about that. Oh gosh. I mean, there's a lot I want to say about experiencing it as a client and maybe we can get into that later in terms of the depth of the work. So maybe I'll I'll earmark that because I did want to make a comment at some point because it's so clearly delineated the model. It's easy to think it's sort of a left brain or 
is right, it like a technique. Capture, like mm-hmm. a technique. It's hard to capture the real depth of it, but hopefully that will come through as we talk. So maybe maybe we'll come back to that subject later. But it's an incredibly deep model. But for me, the precision of the therapist, the clarity of the therapist, who are some of these people are really masters at, at helping me understand and tap into both viscerally and also with words, you know, like an understanding is that it's that moment of, of meeting between an understanding, but the word, you know, the visceral, the yes, what I've learned through being the client and doing the model is that these pieces that Bruce were talking about, these learnings, these synaptic connections, mm-hmm. again, that sounds very sciencey, but what that feels like are inner knowings, inner truths, inner realities. I think reality may be the best word that we live in without even realizing it. Mm-hmm. You know, it can be unconscious and yet it's powerful. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, the phrase, the phrase we often use is emotional truths. Yes. And yes. clients, uh, they, that phrase is so meaningful to them as they're experiencing things they were never aware of that are lifelong emotional truths. And yeah. are you describing this as um, the emotional truth of a particular symptom or yes. are we talking about internal working maps and internal working Both. models? From- okay. Both. Yes, because the emotional truth of a given symptom is both an emotionally felt, bodily felt experience and it includes a mental model. How, of how the world works in a certain area that the person didn't realize they were living in. I love that piece of, of calling it an emotional truth because it's different than a thought mm-hmm. or a cognition. Mm-hmm. And you know when you capture the emotional truth. Oh, it's like, like a, it feels like a, so right. It feels so right. Fosha talks about click of recognition. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, yes, that you nailed it. And in coherence work, they will do a lot of statements of these truths that you might repeat, and then you feel when it feels true. I mean, that's the thing. Are you comfortable then sharing just one? Yes. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, what's even more powerful is if in the work you make this statement toward the attachment figure, for instance, if you're doing more attachment work. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was making all of these statements towards my father. I mean, we we probably went on for 30 minutes. You know my dad, and he's wonderful. (laughs) He's a dear friend of of you. But um, that's okay. You can. <laughs> but he will. He will. He would not mind me sharing this. You're right. But it gave such clarity as I pictured him, and and I would speak my truth, and then some other facet of it would unfold. You know, like I would say, Dad, when you, I can't remember the words now, but you know, when you look away, my experience is this, and therefore I must do this. You know, I feel like I've lost you, and now I'm alone. I will do anything to get you back. You know, it has that, it has that immediacy. It's not a heady mm-hmm. statement. It has this immediacy. I will do anything to get your attention, even if it means I have to feel anxious. Mm-hmm. You know, and mm-hmm. it captures the whole thing. It's something like that was my statement. <laughs> and it captures it, but it brings up emotion, but it's also like the statement itself has a felt component. So maybe for me, I was crying at the same time. I had Mm -hmm. emotion elicited through saying the statement, as you might imagine, picturing my father and getting to the core issue. It's emotional. But I think the piece I was... But that's part of what the chain, that it has to be emotional. It has to be emotional. But the the real important thing is that the knowing feels emotional. Mm -hmm. Not just that I'm sad that that I experienced that or was a sad experience. Mm -hmm. But as I'm feeling it, I can feel in my body viscerally that what I'm saying is hitting it. Right. And this gets at some of how that works, right? Is that that's new. There's something new happening as you are evoking. This. That was, it was unconscious before. Yes. And yet my brain is saying, yes, 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 that's it. Yeah. You know, it's like now it's, it's, it is in there in my brain. And when I give words to it, it's like, yes, that's right. That is our reality. <laughs> that's funny. Yes. We talked yes. some on the show about uh, light bulbs. <laughs> so exactly. It's, exactly. Well, yeah. you're so. bringing your conceptual neocortical thinking verbal self into areas of knowing and meaning and feeling that were outside of awareness. So you get this unified sense of connecting with yourself so deeply in a very unified way. And it makes sense of your life experience to yourself as never before. So how does this happen? What does this look like? The one that comes to mind is a man who came to me, he was in his 40s, he came to me because he was freezing up in social situations, locking up. He just couldn't talk. I mean, it sounds like social anxiety to me. So I was wading into it with him and said, in those situations, could you bring one to mind, a recent one? He brings it to mind. 
and uh, sort of in, in your mind, be back in it and tell me whether it feels like you're feeling anxiety. And he said, well, I guess so, which told me he was not in touch with his emotions if he's guessing mm -hmm. at it. Right. So then I said, well, then tell me this. Does it feel somewhat unsafe? That he connected with. Yes, feels unsafe. And so I kept going with that by asking, well, in your life, in your whole life, does this feel familiar in some way? This feeling that it's unsafe to speak. I was pretty sure that would start to resonate more deeply, and it did. It did. Immediately, images of his father and being a boy under his tyrannical, roaring, rageaholic, you know, heavily emotionally and verbally abusive, narcissistic father started coming to mind. And therapists have heard about from many clients uh, started pouring out in, in memory. He was having memory snippets showing up of, you know, spilling a glass of milk or not getting an arithmetic problem right on his homework. And his dad roars, how can you be so stupid? You know, and, and just made his self-worth very negative all his life. So we arrived by just staying with that and deepening into the emotional truth of his experience under his father, putting into words what he learned, that to make any mistake, any mistake is too dangerous to risk because I'll be humiliated and feel worthless and the blast of that anger coming at me is scorching and unbearable and terrifying. So I've got to avoid making any mistake. That's what he learned. Mm -hmm. And what happens as we grow up when we learn these things is that these emotional learnings generalize. So he was expecting that any adult in the room, even with him being now an adult in his 40s, on a subcortical level, you know, we can think of it as his child self, that area of learning, you know, when we learn something as a child, that learning stays operative, as we talked about earlier. These things don't fade out. The brain evolved to maintain emotional learnings. So, you know, when somebody says, hey, that was 40 years ago, get over it, they don't understand how the emotional learning and memory system works. Nobody gets over it. Well, it also can be an enactment of what happened, you know, like the shame or the dismissiveness of that experience. You know, you're a grown ass man. You, what's, you know, why are you talking about your child? You know, that kind of yes. stuff where that it's, yeah, that it's rage. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but the generalization happens and the persistence of the emotional learning happens. It stays outside of awareness. Mm -hmm. But he's in a room with people and there's a level that he's not aware of, but his right. body feels it. He's actually expecting that somebody in this room, if I say something that is wrong or they think is wrong, could come at me like dad did. Mm -hmm. And his locking up became apparent to both of us as we're getting into this more and more deeply. His locking up is actually his solution mm -hmm. to the problem mm -hmm. that somebody could respond like that. Mm -hmm. He thought he was defective. He thought he had some pathology or something's broken. And by bringing out these emotional learnings, the first therapeutic effect that it has is that it beautifully depathologizes. I was just thinking that I love the problem. Machine. People get it that I'm not broken. I learned this and it makes sense of my experience in life. It's very satisfying. And again, like you said, it's a very deep connection with self. So we've arrived at the emotional truth and, and, and it becomes apparent. It's not just emotion. It's emotion plus other major things. It's a model of the world. It's a model of human beings for him. People can respond like that when I make a mistake. And so now we have the emotional learning that is driving and maintaining his unwanted behavior of going speechless when he's around other people. And now that emotional learning is the target of change. And now here is where the memory reconsolidation process starts, because what you need to carry out the memory reconsolidation process is the target emotional learning. You know, when neuroscientists do their reconsolidation studies in laboratories, they first create the emotional learning that they're going to then experiment with and, and unlock and 
dissolve through reconsolidation. So they know what it is, and they know how to disconfirm it, and we'll get to that in a minute. But poor therapists are completely in the dark when they start with a client. They have no idea what the underlying emotional learning is. So we first have to discover and bring it into awareness. And that's what I just described about this client of mine. So now we have that target learning, and now the reconsolidation process can begin. And in coherent therapy, like I said, we carry out the same set of experiences that scientists have shown erases emotional learnings. And what you need to do, these experiences required by the brain, it's three experiences. First is the reactivation of the target emotional learning so that it's, it's happening now, right? And the second experience is while it's happening, the person has an experience that unmistakably shows them, wait a minute, the world doesn't function as I'm expecting according to this emotional learning. So there's a both at once experience that in coherence therapy, we call it juxtaposition experience. And it's an unmistakable, decisive disconfirmation of what the person knows and expects about the world according to their target learning. So I had to now guide my client to find his own living knowledge, his own personal experience that the world is different than that. Different than if I make a mistake, I'm going to get a blast of rage and shaming and humiliation like dad would do. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm familiar with this emotional learning, this specific mental model or schema that he carries, I could, in a focused manner, guide him to look for contradictory knowledge. So I very simply said, well, tell me, have you ever visibly made a mistake with one or more people, and they didn't respond like that at all, and it, it didn't go badly. And he said, uh, you know, huh, gee, I never thought about it this way, he said. And now counterexamples start popping to mind, because once the emotional learning or schema is explicit, and this is one of the important reasons for putting it into words in, a, in an accurate, careful way, it sets it up for this disconfirmation process, as well as bringing the client, the person, into knowing what they've been knowing without knowing it all along, you know? So, yes, he says, yeah, yeah, actually, I, I made a mistake. I bought the wrong thing in a store a couple of weeks ago, and I, I had to bring it back and get an exchange, and I was anxious about bringing it back. I was so uncomfortable bringing it back, and I didn't even know why. Now I know why. And I handed it to the clerk and was tense and the clerk stayed friendly and relaxed and said, oh, okay, sure. Do you want your money back? Do you want to get a replacement? And it went fine and easy, no problem. I made a visible mistake and it was no problem. And we found like four other examples of that, including all through his life. He made a big mistake in his senior year in high school with a, some major term paper, got it wrong. And the teacher in that class was very kind and helpful in helping him set it right. No scorn, no, you know, punitiveness. Mm -hmm. So we stacked up a number of really important examples in his life of making mistakes and getting kindness and helpfulness in response in great contrast to that. So now we have the contradictory knowledge. And it's not just positive thinking. It's the client's. It's just as real to the client as the emotional target learning is. So now comes the third step that the brain requires, the third experience. And this is the one that does the unlearning. It's just a few immersions, a few revisitings of that both at once juxtaposition, which I guided for him in a very natural way by simply saying, okay, now let's, let's review your life experience of making mistakes. And then I evoked the target learning, one side of the juxtaposition, by simply saying, you had such intense experiences of your father responding to mistakes with blasting, blasts of rage and shaming, humiliating you, which you suffered intensely. It was really agony for you, and that happened hundreds of times throughout your childhood in that family. So you came into your adult life knowing 
that making one mistake of any kind could bring on such suffering. So you better avoid making any mistake as much as possible. And that's been a very strong knowing you've had all your life. And he's nodding, yes, yes, yes. And then I said, now hold that on one side as we add this other side of your own experience, which is that out in the world with many different people, you've seen for yourself that you can make a mistake and people do not respond like Dad did. They remain relaxed and helpful and kind when you make a mistake. And you've been very surprised here in our sessions recognizing this. But does that feel real and true to you also? And he's nodding. Yes, it does. He had his eyes closed as he's holding these personal experience memories. And then I said, summing up the juxtaposition, how is it for you right now to be holding these very different knowings and experiences of making a mistake? So there's the disconfirmation experience. And just revisiting that both at once juxtaposition two or three more times in the course of the session is a set of counter-learning experiences. In other words, the expectation, the generalized expectation that anybody will, will respond like that or could is crashing right into his own experience that, no, it's not so. I've never seen anybody respond to me making a mistake like that. Mm -hmm. So that is counter-learning. And because the neural encoding of the target learning has been unlocked, and I, I should have put that into the explanation as I was going along, the brain rapidly unlocks the neural encoding of the target learning at the first encounter with the disconfirmation of the target learning. It's what the researchers call prediction error, right? He's expecting that anybody is capable of uh, and is likely to respond like that. And then with that activated, he has his own experience that it's not so. And that prediction error within minutes literally unlocks the neurochemical, the synapses and whatever else is involved in the encoding of the target learning. And it's because the target learning is now in that unlocked state that the counter learning comes in and directly drives the rewriting of the encoding of that target learning. So what we're rewriting in this case is his generalization of the dad response to all people. His memory of experiencing dad is unaffected. This process doesn't erase autobiographical memory or what's uh, called episodic memory, memory of specific experiences and perceptions. This memory of that is completely intact. What's being changed and erased is the generalization of dad to all people. Yeah, I think of that like with the hippocampus, right, it has the autobiographical memory and that that's intact because right. that's stored differently. But right. the deeper where it's more traumatic where that it's problematic in the limbic that that's what we're wanting to in a sense stir up and that's right. rise that's right. so that it doesn't settle back down in the same way that has always unconsciously been um, exactly encoded. exactly we're not disconfirming that it happened with dad you can't right. disconfirm that it happened right. with dad so that memory doesn't get changed but his mental right. model that people in general are likely to respond the same way that's what's getting nullified and erased. Mm -hmm. And he came back in the next session and said that he was not as locked up in several situations since this session that we did where we had the juxtaposition experiences happen. There was still something happening, and we had to do some more work. And it turned out that the full effect was partially blocked. This is so fascinating to us. was initially partially blocked, because there was one consequence of nullification and erasure that was itself distressing. And he said to me, you know, this, um, this, the, the, there's, it's, it's, it's pretty upsetting um, to see that other people are not going to respond that way. 
which this may seem counterintuitive to our no, listeners. No, I totally but get it. It's lost. pretty upsetting because now I see that people aren't like that. My dad was like that. And what he was, most children t- you know, receiving abuse from their parents think they deserve it and think that the parent is just being a normal parent in treating them that way. But then in therapy, when they realize, no, that wasn't normal parenting, that was harsh mistreatment. That, it's very disturbing to see that your parent inflicted that on you and betrayed you in that way. So he was bumping into this now, and we had to do a few sessions processing that recognition, processing the grieving that accompanied that recognition. Well, it would be huge because he, would ha- he had identified with his father to some degree with the idea of that he deserved it. And, that right. that, and so that right. all made sense and it was all co- coherent. And then the shaking it up, all of a sudden, now he has to really step out and see his father yes. in a totally different way. Yes. And, and then yeah. look at the damage that he himself has done, you know, unconsciously by encoding that like the loss that he's had all these experiences where yes that's started. right that's right there's lost time yeah. oh i've had some clients who i've lived all these decades believing i'm worthless and making right. choices accordingly when i wasn't and it was just something you know negative messaging i took in from them that grief and lost potential alone can take several sessions of uh, processing before the full shift of all these meanings is allowable. The, the client sort of hits the brakes. Yeah, because even by seeing it from his father's eyes, he and his father are together. So that loss, too, of that he loses out. I don't know if it destroyed his father for him, but you know what I'm saying? That Yes, a- that's one of the major pieces we encounter is that by believing the parents negative messages to you either verbally or behaviorally negative you're staying in shared reality and that's a big aspect of attachment Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with one's parents is being in shared reality with them and especially shared reality about yourself they think i'm a piece of crap and i do too and so now i feel we're all together here (laughs) i feel seen and known by them even Mm -hmm. though the content is negative you know Attachment connection is what matters to children, that it's, it's oxygen to them. And if the connection has to be made of negativity because all that, that's all that's there, well, that works. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, even as an adult, when you desubscribe from believing the negative messages, you are losing lots of shared reality and people feel the disconnect from their parents. Mm-hmm. That connective tissue does decrease and, mm-hmm. and accepting that and tolerating that. And, and I just wanted to add there a little bit, that helped me a lot, your work, Bruce, in working with self-esteem or self-valuing, self-worth issues. Simply this piece y'all are both discussing so eloquently that people aren't aware that to value themselves would bring up a lot of anxiety because of these issues you're yes. talking about. And that a big piece in working with self-esteem is not so much, but you are so great. You know, right. let me list the ways you're so wonderful, please. You know, and please believe me. Right. It's, you just it's, lost them there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, wow. And however you do this, Bruce actually in, 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 in encounter, uh, excuse me, in coherence therapy, they have some steps for this. But however you do it to help the client become more conscious that would actually terrify me to feel good about myself. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. It, it it's, for many reasons, but go ahead. It, yeah, this again seems counterintuitive at first, even to many therapists, that low self-esteem is actually a tactic that avoids several even worse sufferings. That doesn't mean the client likes it. It's not about liking it. But it's but familiar and it's known. The psyche intuitively knows mm-hmm. to buy into the parents' negative messages because that avoids seeing how they don't see me, I'm alone and disconnected here, mm-hmm. how mistreated I'm being, how helpless I am under it, and rage, anger can come up that itself is very dangerous if you know you're being mistreated. All of these things and many others, in fact, Corey was mentioning there's a section in the Coherence Therapy Practice Manual that itemizes the specific ordeals and sufferings that are successfully avoided by being in low self-esteem. And when you step out of low self-esteem, the ones you've been avoiding show up fresh as a daisy and have to be dealt with. Now, as an adult, you're capable of dealing with these things. As a little child, you're not. And 
the low self-esteem is actually an adaptive tactic that gets you through it. Well, I love uh, that we're talking about this because, again, I can really resonate with that. And I can I imagine that our listeners, like this is where it gets more bottom up than, you know, the techniques or the ideas or those sorts of things. And I also really like, if I understand it correctly, Tori, you were saying, or both of you are saying, these are a set of principles that can be applied in different kinds of therapies. Is that? Oh, yes, yes. And well, it explains why therapy works. Yeah, yeah. We don't maintain that it's only coherence therapy that carries out memory reconsolidation and gets transformational change. No, there are many different systems of therapy that actually produce transformational change. What's exciting to us is that if indeed it's true that this memory reconsolidation process is the brain's core process that accomplishes such a quality of change, not as a, as a theory, but as, as they say, empirical studies, you know, have shown that it's so. It's not theorizing. It happens in the laboratory. And we've carried it over into therapy. And we do the same experiences and the same effects happen. Well, this should mean that in any published case example from any system of therapy that does show transformational change, if it's a detailed enough account in the case description, we ought to be able to find the same set of experiences somewhere embedded in the work. And we've carried out that exercise now for 10 different systems of therapy. And indeed, unambiguously, the set of experiences is there in each of those cases. And even though those experiences are not named and defined right. in each therapy's description of itself, but there they are in the embedded in the process, which seems to be strong circumstantial evidence for our view that this memory reconsolidation process is, is, part of how it's working. is universally what's causing transformational change whenever it, it occurs and can serve now as a unifying framework for the psychotherapy field, which has been so fragmented. I mean, a lot of therapists, I'd say a majority in my experience, going around teaching, giving workshops, I'd say a majority of therapists are in active distress over the fragmented state. Tori touched on this in her opening comments. You know, you know EMDR does it. Uh, ADP does it. Uh, Emotion-focused therapy does it. Internal family systems therapy does it. There's a, a, a group on the, on the East Coast had me come in and give a one-day workshop. And the members of this professional group are therapists who practice most of the therapies I just named. Right. Uh, in other words, each of the therapists in the group practices several of these therapies. And at the start of the workshop, one of them stood up and said, we know these therapies work, but they're so different on their, in their techniques. We don't know why they work and all produce these results. By the end of my workshop, which consisted of videos of many different case examples of many different clients with many different symptoms where I used, there were videos of my own work where I used many different techniques to produce the critical experiences. At the end, they stood up and said, you've done it. We now know why they all work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was that's a exciting. sweet moment for me oh, at the that's end wonderful. of that workshop because that's what I I'm wonder, trying to show. Oh, that's so exciting. I wonder if I can say back to the two of you, what I think that you're describing, just in my own words, as a non-trained person, I'm again, bridging for folks what we're talking about. And I'm happy to get it wrong in that way. You guys can <laughs> correct me or what have you. But my sense of it is that, again, memory is typically seen as a file that you open and is objective, that it's actually happened, all those things. But the notion of it is, is that you open your memory file. Again, this is just my words. And rather than having the expected experience, meaning the memory file might be unconscious, so the freeze happens or what have you. And I think of Phil Bromberg, analyst that I just love, and he talks about standing between two spaces yeah. and he can see the different selves. And I really, really love that. So there's something about getting to the emotional memory, right? The truth, which is already a little different than say an interpretation or the therapist telling you what's happening. Oh, but yes. it sounds like that the therapist in this model are applying this and how whatever model that they use helps the client find their own experience, which we couldn't even know. Right. But rather than just pulling it up, 
and being dysregulated and then it, it sort of um, settling back into its same file that there's a little bit of a way I think of like a snow globe or something like we're shaking it up with some surprise or some difference whether it be the juxtaposition of that that's oh that's actually not true or what have you but that we don't want it to settle back in the same way we don't want to close that file in the same way we really need that's to put right. something else in it which makes a new file that's right. In coherence therapy, we define the first two stages of the work as discovery, where you first bring this into awareness yeah. and as both an affective, emotionally felt experience, but putting the words on it that name the contents of the emotional learning in words. That's the discovery work when it first shows up. And then we have a next phase is integration. Mm -hmm. which is what you were just saying, Sue. We don't want it to just drop back down into the dark. We want this felt knowing of this emotional truth to become routinely present in daily life for the client. That sets it up for that last stage of creating juxtaposition experiences by finding contradictory knowings. I yes. bet you get this a lot where people have had their own way of working, which is kind of what you were just describing. Then it's like the light bulb of oh, this is why that this is working. But what the way we talk about it on the show is you first have to find where your bones are buried, which is the discovery. <laughs> then you map your ghosts. So those are the things that are persistent and we have to kind of find them. And then the last one is the reorganization and the updating the map, which is yes. learning. So it sounds like that that just tracks unintentionally in some ways. But, yeah. but yeah. That's what, I imagine you get that a lot. Sure, yes, because... This process really is built into the brain and mind. Like I said, this isn't coming from a theory. Yep. And I've seen this a lot. Any therapists, whether they're talking about a, a known therapy system or their own you know, use of their own sessions over many years as a yep. laboratory to understand how change works, anybody who really pays attention to the process of change without theorizing comes to that process you just described. Yep, yep. And, Names and, it in different ways. You know, exactly, that's what I was saying. The, the language doesn't matter, but what you're really putting out there to the world is that you want people to understand what's actually happening so yes. that we get more effective and efficient. That's it, yeah. that's it. And now it we have the neuroscience backing yep. up our observations and processes. Yeah, right. so we have the objective side of it now yeah I, that's so so incredibly exciting i was thinking about it watching it happen in group tori i know that you know that we've done a lot of group trainings and stuff like that together but so that you can see the risk like the emotional learning the risk of the new behavior you know what i mean again the juxtaposition over and over and over and over so i was just thinking about the application of this in groups as well and again i imagine this happens where that people get excited about like, oh, it's, you know, and they begin to see what they've always seen, which is really what the process is for the client. And one thing, if I can insert that I really appreciate, Bruce, about helping therapists not stand in the way of that natural process. Yes. And, oh, my gosh. And one of the things that I, I learned a lot from you, and maybe I'll just set you up to talk a little bit more about it, I find it actually very touching, is the difference between counteractive measures and non-counteractive measures. Yeah. So when I was mentioning that therapists might stand in the way of that, the moment that you say something that prefers what you think is true or would be a healthier reality to them and tries to convince them of that versus just making space to really unearth and clarify what feels real to them. Yes. It's like yes. the resistance, the brain's going to say, yes. oh, yeah, you're right, and now I'll stop talking from the." So, Bruce, yes. maybe you can speak to that a bit. Well, I especially love the part about the stuff that, ther that therapists can do wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think nearly all of us, therapists and non-therapists, have what we call the counteractive reflex, meaning you want to get away from the stuff that feels bad, mm -hmm. right? You want to get away from it. You want to build up the stuff you prefer, whether it's beliefs or behaviors or mood, right? And therapists have that reflex as much as anybody, and many therapies are actually sort of based on building up the preferred patterns so they become strong enough to happen instead of the unwanted patterns, right? And often that, there are different phrases for that. I think uh, in the phrase emotional regulation usually means that, where you learn inner techniques or states of mind or beliefs or behaviors that will limit 
the expression of the negative unwanted states. And you cultivate them with many repetitions over time. Memory reconsolidation is fundamentally different than that. Mm -hmm. Memory reconsolidation, you're right, in the process, in the session, minute to minute, we don't rush to fix it or change it. The initial phases of the work are very much an empathic being with the emotional truth that's in Yeah, because you've got to seduce it to come out versus... You, yes, it's very, you have to create a safe space mm-hmm. that's very invitational with lots of genuine empathy for, yes, of course you learn to expect that anybody would pounce on you for making any mistake the way your dad did. And just being with that for as many sessions as it takes for the client to feel that it's workable to be with that and embrace that truth. And uh, in some cases, a grief process happens right at that point before the change process happens. It's a very unique journey with each client. But I'd say a majority of our trainees in coherence therapy and memory consolidation have to grapple with their own counteractive reflex in order to not try to get away from the discovered material in order to set up better material as the alternative rather than so, so do you mean like coming, position. Yeah. like coming in and soothing the person that's anxious? Or, yes, or right. teaching relaxation techniques. Right. <laughs> or oh, anger management work is almost <laughs> always purely counteractive. Whereas I had a, a woman client who had a, a lifelong serious degree of anger problem that would had tormented her marriage of 28 years. And we got to the bottom of what was driving her anger. It was far out of awareness. She had been molested as a six-year-old girl by her grandfather. And she had had therapy for that and had dealt with it significantly, but there was a piece that was never found. And we went back into it. And with a focus on this resentful anger that she was so prone to go into all her life, and we looked at the original ordeal of that molestation through this lens. And I, and I had her find, what do you resent about suffering that most of all? And to her surprise, she said, and this was new awareness coming yeah. into uh, her experience as I was watching her. She said, it's, it's not my grandfather. It's something about the world. And we deepened into that. And she wound up recognizing and voicing something that just about knocked me out of my chair. She said, I resent life itself for doing this to me and to no other child. Mm. As a six-year-old girl, she construed that she was the only child that this ever happened to. Mm. I, I could never have imagined that that was her emotional learning. Right. This is this shows why it's so important to bring it out of the client Mm -hmm. and not try to be brilliant enough to know what it is. Right. Because each person has a unique emotional learning history. And, you know, as a six year old girl in in her world, this was never talked about. It didn't seem to exist in the world, but it happened to her and to her. It was huge, Mm -hmm. huge. You know, any any male or female, any child that is molested knows that you think about it every day your whole life Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in one way or another, unless it's some people suppress it out of awareness so fully that they don't. But many people who suffer molestation, they're processing it or thinking about it or reminded of it often. But this piece was outside of awareness that Mm -hmm. she had construed that life let this happen to her and no one else. So the arbitrariness and unfairness of life was a burning resentment in her little heart and stayed that way as she grew up out of awareness. Mm -hmm. And so whenever any situation had any quality of unfairness or arbitrariness, it re-triggered her anger over the molestation. And that's why so many situations in life had activated this angry, resentful state of mind. And she had no idea why until this session Mm -hmm. uncovered it. 
So why did I get into that? Somebody help me remember my train of thought here. Um, well, I don't know what it was, but I, it, I think it's such a great so, example of how idiosyncratic, how, how surprising yes, these are. Yes. They're oh, not obvious. Yes. Yeah. Imagine trying to get rid of her anger by counteracting it. When oh, I'm yeah. It just reinforces exactly the same thing, right? So that would be it shows how, what a sur- superficial approach that is. And by getting to the true core of the underlying emotional learning, that's how transformational change happens. And indeed, her anger reactions stopped after that session. And various situations happened in the family over the next few months that would have easily triggered it. And she was very happy to come in and report, I'm not getting angry. I'm not getting resentful. Well, it's like that you got to, there was this little nugget that That's was right. there, a, kind of a, and that she wouldn't, know. there's no way she could have known. That's right. This you was don't the know, no way. That's of the right. anger, That's and it right. was no longer there. Oh, exactly. Oh, it opens I, up. I've got to quickly include what happened. Uh, the juxtaposition was created with her in the following way. This will take 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. She said to me the first time. I love your excitement, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she said to me the first time, life let this happen to me and to no other little girl. And she was angry as she said it. And I knew what I was hearing. So I said to her, say that to me again. Life let this happen to me and to no other little girl. I said, yes, say it to me again. And the third time, what I knew what happened started to happen. Life let it happen to me. And halfway through it, her eyes started darting around and her brow furrowed, and the rest of her knowings as an adult started to connect to this. And she said, wait a minute. This happens to children all the time. It's a truth of life. And the disconfirming knowledge showed up when it was already there inside of her, but it was in a different memory network completely. We had never touched. Now we created the juxtaposition. It happened to me alone. No, it didn't. It happens to children. Life was not unfair to me. In that specific sense, she had learned that this was allowed to happen to me only. No, it didn't happen to me only. So the specific unfairness she had learned literally disappeared. It yeah. didn't exist in memory anymore. I can and totally see that. That's why her anger never again happened in the same old way. So I imagine people getting excited about this model. Can you all speak to some of the trainings that are coming up and for folks who want to learn more and how to reach you? And Tori, you mentioned something about a conference here in Austin, Texas. Yeah, so I work out of a practice called Deep Eddy Psychotherapy, and we are bringing Saturday, February 15th, 2020. So this coming February, Bruce and Sarah Bridges, his lovely colleague, to Austin to do a day-long introductory on coherence therapy. We actually had a Sunday that was going to be smaller, experiential. Well, it's still happening, but I think it's sold out already, actually. I didn't wow. mention that to you, Bruce. But anyone who's desperate to come, maybe let me know, because maybe there'll be cancellations for a smaller, intimate gathering on Sunday where we'll actually break you should put You should put me on that waiting list. Okay, good. I'll, I'll, <laughs> you're, you're, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but this Saturday will be an introductory day. So if you want information, if you want to sign up, you can go to deepeddypsychotherapy.com deep eddy psychotherapy.com under four clinicians it will be right there the training and you can register that way so yeah, yeah sarah dr sarah bridges is my co-director of the coherent psychology institute and she's a professor at the uh, university of memphis and where we haven't presented in austin before so we're very excited about bringing all this to an introductory two-day workshop in Austin. Austin is so unique. We have training. Like, we are just insane with our training, considering our size and everything. But that is fantastic. All right, we'll jump into the fray Oh, man, believe me. Believe me. And also, uh, anybody who's too far can't come to Austin. Yeah, I was going to say, where else? Our website, coherenceinstitute.org. CoherenceInstitute.org, many resources. There are some case example transcripts that are free. There are many articles that are a one-click download. We have many publications on this from introductory to advanced. A whole lot of resources on both coherence therapy and memory reconsolidation on that website. That's fantastic. And I know that there's a lot of people doing training and sharing some of it. So this makes it more accessible and we really want the accessibility. So you just put it in YouTube and you're going to find people speaking about it. And 
yes. um, at least, you know, little chunks of it. And so I love that because then it makes it, you know, widely, widely available. And then for folks who want to do that deeper training. Oh, the conference is deepeddypsychotherapy.com under four clinicians. The website is Coherence Institute, one word, coherenceinstitute.org. There's a lot there. Right on the homepage is a link to a page that lists all upcoming trainings and presentations all around That's the world. Great. It's a wonderful so, website, actually. And yeah. I have for clinicians and everyone, and, I, and on YouTube, I've made some videos explaining some of this for clients specifically. Oh, good, Tori. So Tori Olds on YouTube that are, you know, to get clients jumped in thinking about. Right. Tori, Tori T-O-R-I-O-L-D-S. Yes. Yes. That's wonderful. So we do want to invite our listeners to go to the show notes because we'd love to pack in resources like this for you to make this worth your time and effort. So thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Tori, for making this link. And thank thank you so much. I really look forward to hopefully meeting you here in Austin and being uh, able to do that. And anybody else, he does trainings all over. So don't feel left out if you're not in Austin, Texas. Just go to his website and you'll be able to find all kinds of information. So, all right, well, thank you. Thank you, what a pleasure, thank you. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson. 